once upon a time, you were doing every magazine interview back when there were a lot of magazines. You were on mm. all the covers and showing up all over the press and all over social media. You've been much more reserved of late, talking less and doing more, one might say. What's that all about? I see some of my favorite musicians getting mad on Twitter. And it's so embarrassing. And I do. I've done it. I cringe. I cannot believe I said some of the stuff. You know, and then I go and look at like, I won't name some of these people, but they're older than me and they're like kind of rock star legends and they are continuing to do that. And it just literally destroys this image. And I don't want it to destroy that image that I have, you know? So like in my head, I'm like, no, man, this guy, he's like, you're complaining about, um, I don't know, you, there's a long list, you know? I mean, of course, these platforms are designed to be addictive. And for those of us who might struggle with impulse control, it's such a perfect drug to right. be able to just get on there and react to everything that's happening. It's definitely addicting. It is. And that's why I don't have it on my phone. I feel like your quality of life goes down and you don't even realize it's going down, like mentally, like because yeah. you're constantly looking at Instagram, constantly. What's the frog in boiling water, right? Yeah, you're constantly looking at Facebook and you're just constantly looking at people upset at each other all the time. That's what, that's what I've noticed. I think taking it off your phone sounds like a nice happy medium, yeah. as opposed to becoming one of those people that's like, I'm not even on there, I don't even have it. Because that, that becomes a thing in and of itself too, right? There's no tone, you can't, you can't type tone. So if you make a joke, you know, where's the tone? If somebody's, if a certain person's having a bad day, they're gonna read it in the tone, that, you know, of how yeah. they feel instead of like how I feel. And it becomes like a historical record it's and, like, and it's the like, context of the times changes. Yeah, it's like I tweet, just went to the bathroom. That's how I feel. And someone reads it like, just went to the bathroom because they, they don't, you know what I mean? So, yeah. I don't know. And also, why would you tweet, just went to the bathroom? And I've done that. I've done that multiple fuck times. <laughs> and it's, you know, and people posting pictures of their food. And if you see my timeline from like 2007, I'm tweeting my coffee order. It's, it, do you cringe? Yeah, of course. Exactly. Yeah. It's, like, it's so cringy, cares? bro. You know? It's so yeah. cringy. But if you look back on stuff, that's why everything is deleted. I don't, I do not want to cringe at myself anymore. I already got good girls, bad guys. And, Bad Girls Club and stuff like that to, to look at forever, so. Are you cringing at that stuff now? Yes, yes. Yeah, they're, like it's like, they're like TikTok sensations now. It's <laughs> given it a whole new life. You, do you see like the format? You, you see what's happening yeah. though? Yeah, it's interesting to see how it persists, right? And what new ways people are discovering music. I mean, we're talking like classic rock bands and stuff like that. Listen to me advocating for TikTok, an app that <laughs> I don't have and don't understand. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I can appreciate that it's bringing things hey man i'm not a, complaining you know. i'm not complaining because it just literally makes my streams go up like exponentially you sure. know but uh you're allowed to cringe at stuff you know like when my hair was this big it looked like <laughs> a cross between like macho man randy savage and uh, uh van halen you know what i mean like motley Crue. but uh i'm sure motley Crue and uh warrant and all those bands look back on photos and videos of them and kind of cringe a little sure. bit. I mean, it's like yearbook photos. It was a moment in time and it was uh, a great memory too as well. Yeah, I mean, and seeing throngs of the Warp Tour audience physically sitting down during Bad Girls Club. And part this of the is the heaviest song you have ever and heard. Then, no, but I mean, the part, the part, the, right, wasn't that the song where you'd have everyone yeah. sit down yeah, and yeah, then yeah. everyone get up and occasionally they're there's always the one person who's like way in the back. Hey, don't get me wrong. I still perform those songs. <laughs> yeah. I'll still perform them because those songs bang live. They're just, yeah. they just bang forever, you know, like, uh, but I remember, here's a good example of uh, Alone, the song called Alone. And it was when uh, trap and rap or trap and metal, it kind of didn't exist. I don't know, like trap metal, not rap rock, right? Right. What I was doing felt like it didn't really exist in a sense of like, I don't know how you'd there say that. There was dubstep stuff coming in and like yeah. trap stuff, it, like it, you said, and it was unique a different in its, style. Yeah. yeah, but the lyrics, I remember my label calling me and uh, Brett, and he goes, hey man, you try to be nice. It's like, you should change the lyrics and the verses uh, to not so like be so knuckleheady. And I was like, 
What's that supposed to mean? And then if you go read the lyrics, it, they're just, oh my God, dude, they're just so, they're, they're, they're corny for sure. There's also hip hop. I mean, hip hop's a, a form that is built on bragging. I fuck with Drake and he, he like, you know, he like brags a lot about stuff, but I just feel like <laughs> it's just looking back. It's like, yeah, maybe I should have said something a little different. It, it's funny what we're talking about this and being reflective that uh, you know, and, and we'll get into all of this, but on the back of the success of Popular Monster, you know, you did The Drug and Me Is You, sort of a thank you to the fans, the reimagined version for the album going gold, which is insane in this climate for anyone to have a gold record. Yeah. And then for that record, the first Falling in Reverse record to go gold, like basically what felt like five minutes before your current song then goes gold. Mm -hmm. So it's, also, it, it's almost like there's always this reaction from the universe, wherever you want to describe it, where people go, oh, well, he has a gold record, but that's like an old record. And then you have a new gold record, like yeah. right afterwards. Yeah, uh, my friend Davey, back in the day, like I, five years ago, he said, man, he goes, you're the mo you're the luckiest person, but with the worst luck. That's what he said, <laughs> you know? And I, I always thought about that. I'm like, he's right. He's like, I got some bad luck, but I got really good luck at the same time. Yeah. You know? Good fortune and bad luck. Combined yeah, or something. I guess. Yeah. yeah some uh, sort of mix. Yeah. I, I don't know. I just wrote about how I felt. I saw, I watched the Joker movie with Joaquin Phoenix and, uh, the song was already in the works. The lyrics weren't. And I, that movie made me feel some type of way, you know, and I just, uh, wrote the lyrics down. That's how I felt when I went into the studio that people, like wonder how my voice is so low. That's how I actually literally felt, you know, I've been to the emergency room many times thinking I was going to, I was dying and it was they They're always like panic attack, you know? Yeah. But this, uh, this was years ago and, uh, it's better now, but I just remember being in the midst of that and be like, nah, you cannot tell me that what I'm feeling is a panic attack. That I'm dying, you know, to have the success with popular monster and to do that sort of reward and gratitude, to the fans with the reimagined version, doing the reimagined, did that kind of lead to the I'm Not a Vampire revamp? There was no real planning. It was just like, kind of like uh, an aha moment kind of thing. And I was like, how can I do this again and make it more modern and uh, make it more like epic, you know? That, that it's, definitely, it's definitely that for sure. <laughs> I could say that with fuck confidence for sure. But Popular Monster, here's the the weird thing about uh, Popular Monster. Uh, obviously, it's about depression and anxiety and post-traumatic stress and rage and, like, all these things, you know. The weird thing is, is in that mind frame going into the studio and the my voice is low because I, I did not feel good. That's I just didn't feel good, and I just was trying to get the, the, the words out. And I was like, I, need, I just need to get the words out. And then uh, my engineer is like, hold on, this sounds crazy. You know, and that's how it started. But the weird thing is, is how I felt then was really how I felt. And then Pop of the Monster exploded and ironically made me feel good. Right. And it completely took me out of that. It's just, it's just, it's music is amazing. You know, that's art at its, at its best. Yeah. Right. Or even like you said, you know, sitting down watching the Joker in the theater and relating that to your own yeah. experience. You're not watching that going like, I'm this character, we're exactly the same. Yeah. You're connecting it to yourself yeah, and because, processing something through that art. You know, I, I felt like, I was like, yeah, a lot of people probably feel like this, but whatever, you know? And then I was like, whoa, everybody feels like this. Why does everybody feel like this? Because that's what it feels like. It feels like everybody has listened to that song 